Hello and welcome to this stream. Um, today I'm going to be going through um, this A2 paper from 2013. So let's get started. A mutation in a gene in the fruit fried Drosophila melanogaster gives rise to white eyed flies instead of the normal red eyed flies. The allele for red eyes, R, is dominant to the allele for white eyes, a small r. A student crossed a red eyed fly with a white eyed fly. The results are shown in table 1.1. So we can see that we um, get 54 red eyed females and 46 white eyed males, and no red eyed males or white eyed females. So. First question, in Drosophila males possess two different sex chromosomes, X and Y, as in humans. Complete the genetic diagram below to show how the results in table 1.1 could have been produced. So we've got a red-eyed fly and a white-eyed fly. We don't know which one's male and which one's female. Um, but we do know that we have um, a red-eyed female and a white-eyed male. So we know um, that um, the genotype of the male is going to be small r x, small r y, because that's the only way we could get a white-eyed male. And we know that the female must have at least one copy of the dominant allele, which is x capital R. And then she could either have two copies or she could be heterozygous. Um, so which way around could this be? So if the red-eyed fly was female, then um, she must be heterozygous because that's the only way that um, the white-eyed male could have could could um, the white-eyed offspring male could be born. Um, however, um, if she was heterozygous um, and had the um, dominant allele as well, then we would expect that some of these offsprings would be red-eyed males, right? So if she had this allele as well, or this genotype, sorry, and then um, the white chromosome would come from this parent, then we would expect that at least one of the offspring would be like so, but that's not the case, right? So we know that she must, ha must be white-eyed. So um, the only way she could be white-eyed is if she was homozygous for the recessive allele, right? Um, so therefore, we know that the um, male is red, so his genotype is this, so gametes are like so. And then um, if you do the Punnett square, if you need to, then um, you'd see that he's, so she's obviously going to be heterozygous as well. And then these are your um, genotypes of the offspring. Okay. <clears throat> Next, uh, the chi-squared test can be used to analyze the results of table 1.1. The expected ratio of red-eyed females to white-eyed males is 1 to 1. Complete table 1.2 and use this to calculate a value for chi-squared. Chi okay, cool. So um, the um, expected um, number of these, since the expected ratio is 1 to 1, is 50 each. And the observed from the red-eyed females is 54, and white-eyed males is 46. So um, um, observed minus expected is 4, and negative 4. Um, and then if you square that, you get 16 each. And divide that by the expected is 0.32. And sum of some of these would get 0.64. And um, the next part, use your calculated value of chi-squared in the table of probabilities below to test the significance of the difference between observed and expected results. So um, degrees of freedom is n minus 1, um, n equals 2, so um, degrees of freedom is 1, so we're looking at the first row. <coughs> and we can see that um, if our significance level is 5%, um, our chi-squared is smaller than this value, so um, we can conclude that there is no significant difference and this variation occurs uh, just through chance, due to chance. All right. <coughs> um, 
Um, the evolutionary origin of the four-legged amphibians, such as frogs and toads from fish, has been the subject of much debate for many years. Among living fish, the rarely, rarely called coelacanth and the lungfish are thought to be most closely related to these amphibians. Samples of blood were taken from two coelacanths uh, that were captured recently near Comoros. The amino acid sequences of the alpha and beta chains of coelacanth and lungfish hemoglobin were compared with the known sequences of amphibian adults and their aquatic larvae. Organisms with more matches in the amino acid sequence of a polypeptide chain share a more recent common ancestor than those with fewer matches. The comparisons with three species of amphibians, Xenopus lavis, Xenopus tropicana and Rana catasbiana, are shown in Table 2.1. So here are the, um, here's the data. Explain whether or not the information in Table 2.1 supports the suggestion that coelacanths and amphibians share a more recent common ancestor than do lungfish and amphibians. Okay, so um, things that um, reinforce uh, this hypothesis is if we have um, a look at a percentage maps, let's have a look first um, at the alpha chains. Um, so um, we, can we can see that coelacanth alpha chain has um, a higher percentage of matches in both um, the adults and the um, tadpoles. Um, if we compare the coelacanth to lungfish, right? Um, however, um, if we look at the beta chains in the adults, um, uh, the lungfish beta chain has a higher percentage of matches with the adult amphibians than coelacanth. Um, but at the same time, in the larvae, coelacanth still has a higher percentage of matches. So, um, um, so the alpha chain, the data from the alpha chain suggests that um, coelacanths are more closely related to amphibians and the beta chains um, don't really um, support this suggestion um, and supports a closer relationship between lungfish and amphibia. So I think that covers it. Suggest why adults and tadpoles of the same species of amphibian have different amino acid sequences in their hemoglobin. So here the key point is to realize that um, the tadpoles are aquatic and the adults are partly terrestrial. So um, there's, def there's definitely going to be different oxygen concentrations between the two habitats. So you will need um, hemoglobin with different oxygen affinities. So once they have gone, gone through that developmental phase, um, the amphibians will um, express a different variation of hemoglobin, or could do, so that they can cope with the terrestrial um, environments. <clears throat> Silicanth hemoglobin has a very high affinity for oxygen, suggesting that silicanth, which have been captured at depth, uh, of between 200 meters and 400 meters live in water that has a low concentration of oxygen. Explain how an environmental factor such as the low concentration of oxygen in deep water can act um, as a stabilizing force in natural selection. So um, this is trying to get at the fact that in a constant environment, um, in this constant environment specifically, um, the low oxygen concentration acts um, as a selection pressure. And um, the organisms that are best adapted to this uh, will survive. And um, phenotypes of either extremes, so individuals that have um, hemoglobin which are um, which has an even higher affinity for oxygen or lower high lower affinity for oxygen um, are is not are not favorable. So um, in this case, um, the population would have a very narrow range of genetic variation. So the sort of allele frequencies are maintained. So um, if we were to put this into graph form, I'm just going to sketch it here quickly. So if we had, um, let's say, in green is the original population. So... Um, on, this is the range of phenotypes. So in this case, the range of phenotypes is hemoglobin affinity for oxygen. Um, and this is uh, either the number of individuals or percentage. 
with such um, a phenotype. Um, and then if this mutation was um, stabilizing, then you would get a shift like so. Okay. So um, the second question, explain how an environmental factor such as the low concentration of oxygen in deep water can act as an evolutionary force in natural selection. So um, in this case, we can consider um, two different cases. Um, so one of them would be um, that the change in um, oxygen concentration from, um, from an original or different oxygen concentration um, will act as um, a selection pressure. And then some of the individuals in their populations are better adapted. Um, and so you would get a directional selection. Um, so the way the graph of that would look like, so the same, th um, imagine, I'm not going to try my horrible handwriting again, but <laughs> the axes are the same. And then you would get, so from something like this, let's say this one is um, the higher affinities up there, that's um, ideal, then you would get a shift of the curve like that. So that would be directional selection, or alternatively, um, if the population uh, develops in different concentrations of oxygen, so two different concentrations of oxygen, then you would get disruptive selection. So the way that would look is, so let's say the two extremes, so this one's your original curve, and then you would get something like, let's say, um, shallow waters, so lower affinity survives better, and then deeper waters, higher affinity survives better. So either one of those, or both, you can talk about. Okay? <clears throat> Explain the role of isolating mechanisms in the evolution of new species. So this one is called, um, so geographic speciation is called um, allopatric speciation and um, this is referring to an event where um, a species is separated into um, two separate populations by some kind um, of geographical obstacle so for instance um, maybe there's um, a mountain um, a mountain ridge um, or a hill and then um, some of the individuals migrate to the other side, and then um, because um, uh, they the populations do not interact, uh, as in there is no individuals that flow from one gene pool, so from one population to the other, um, you and you may get different selection pressures in the two different environments. Um, th uh, so there might be a change in allele frequency. So first of all, because of the different selection pressures, but also due to um, genetic drift or different mutations. If, uh, for example, one of the populations is small, then by chance you could get um, a mutation fixed <coughs> in the population. And then eventually, over a course of time, um, the two, um, two populations cannot successfully interbreed anymore and um, allopatric speciation uh, takes place. Okay. Uh, outline the role of oxygen in anaerob in aerobic respiration. So, um, <coughs> oxygen in aerobic respiration, uh, in oxidative phosphorylation rather, um, acts as a final electron acceptor. So it's reduced to water um, as it accepts hydrogen ions uh, to form water, um, and uh, therefore, uh, it frees up. Um, so, it, sorry, it lets the electron transport chain to continue, and it uh, promotes the production of ATP. And this is underpinned by the fact that, um, in the absence of oxygen, only glycolysis and therefore anaerobic respiration continues. <coughs> sorry, water break. Table 3.1 shows the results of some measurements um, of the energy released by different respiratory substrates and the water produced in the process. Um, so it's uh, carbohydrate, lipids and proteins, and we've got the energy released per gram of substrate um, and per decimeter cubed of oxygen consumed, and here we've got the mass of water produced. 
per gram substrate. So describe and explain the differences in energy released by the three respiratory substrates. So um, we can have a look at um, the energy released per um, gram of substrate and we can immediately see that the most energy is released um, by the by the lipids. So this is due to the fact that um, lipids are um, have long fatty acid chains, triglycerides have long fatty acid chains, which have way more um, CH bonds than carbohydrates or proteins <clears throat> per unit mass, and hydrogens are needed for ATP production. So, um, so that is the reason why per unit mass you get more energy released. Suggest why more water is produced from the metabolism, met metabolism of lipid than from the other two substrates. So indeed, we can see um, there's more uh, water produced. So um, once again, this goes back to the fact that uh, because there's more hydrogens available to produce um, uh, uh, oxygen to water, you get more uh, water produced per unit mass. <clears throat> Many women use the knowledge of their menstrual cycle as a family planning method, avoiding sexual intercourse during the part of the cycle when it's possible for fertilization to occur. This part of the cycle is known as the fertile window. In women, with regular 28-day menstrual cycles, ovulation is likely to take place on day 14. Most guidelines state that the fertile window lasts from day 10 to day 17 of the menstrual cycle. Explain why the fertile window begins several days before ovulation takes place. So, um, one of the reasons is due to the fact that sperm can uh, survive up to five days. Um, uh, and, um, it, it, yeah, so even though ovulation hasn't occurred yet at the point um, uh, where when sperm is present, uh, by the time that it does, sperm could still survive and fertilize the egg um, after ovulation. Okay. So, next. Figure 4.1 shows how basal body temperature and the concentration of luteinizing hormone LH vary during one menstrual cycle of a woman. Basal body temperature is the temperature of the body just after waking in the morning. So we can see that um, the basal body temperature um, increases after ovulation and then de decreases once again at the end of the cycle. On figure 4.1, sketch a curve to show the changes in the concentration of progesterone in the blood during this menstrual cycle. So we know that um, uh, progesterone is low until about day 13. Um, and then once ovulation takes place, um, it peaks. So I'm just trying to figure out how I can show the peak. So around day 22. So get a peak like so. And then once again, um, returns to low by the end of the cycle, like so. Okay. <clears throat> the follicular phase of the menstrual cycle begins when menstruation starts and ends when ovulation takes place. With reference to figure 4.1 suggests when the follicular phase began and ended during this menstrual cycle. So, um, without looking at it, um, it probably started at day one, but let's have a look anyway. Um, yep. <laughs> and then, um, so, ends once ovulation takes place. So, in this case, that could be around day 14. So, there's the peak. 14. <coughs> Three methods that a woman can use for determining her fertile window are First method, using the date at which each menstruation begins to predict when ovulation will occur. Method two, using disposable urine dip sticks to measure the amount of LH breakdown products in the urine. So the more LH in the blood, the more breakdown products. Okay. Method three, wearing an electronic device in the armpit that continuously measures body temperature. Suggest why using method one alone is not likely to be a very reliable method of avoiding contraception. So first of all, um, you can mention the fact that um, a lot of a lot of women's cycles are um, quite irregular. Um, so other than the fact that they are um, 
already irregular, they can be influenced by other factors. So like travel or stress or um, illness. And next, explain how method two could be used to avoid contraception. So this one is taking, this one is looking at the um, amount of LH um, in urine. So um, this one, the way this could be used is you could avoid uh, sexual intercourse when the LH levels are high, because you know that that's when um, ovulation will take place. Um, and you can you can also predict the next surge, the next LH, LH surge, if you um, keep um, track of the LH concentrations. Suggest why method three is likely to be a better predictor of ovulation than measuring basal temperature with a thermometer each day. So uh, the change, as we can see from this graph, the change isn't that much. So from 36.3 something, to 36.7 something is quite a, oh sorry actually 36.4 something to 36.7 something is quite um, a small change so it's likely that there's um, enough error in it's in the thermometer or it's not as um, as uh, accurate as if you were to use um, um, this continuous monitoring so um, since the, this temperature change is quite small, um, yeah, so continuous measurement will avoid misleading, misreading of values or inaccuracy. Okay. A study was carried out into the timing of the fertile window. The study involved 221 women who were trying to get pregnant. Urine samples from each woman were tested for LH breakdown products every day for several months. For several months. The women recorded uh, the days on which they had sexual intercourse and also the days on which menstruation began. 136 of the women became pregnant during the study. The results were used to calculate the probability of a woman being in the fertile window on each day over cycle. The results for women with regular 28-day cycles are shown in figure 2.4.2. Okay. Discuss what these results suggest about the guidelines that the fertile window lasts from day 10 to day 17 of the menstrual cycle. Um, so, from this, we can immediately see that except for the first around three days um, and last days of the cycle um, pretty much there's a probability of you of getting pregnant at any day of the cycle um, so the guidelines should probably include more days not only day 10 and 17 so for example if you look at day 18's probability around here and day 10's probability around here they pretty much have this exact same probability, and yet in the guidelines, day 18 is marked as being um, probable of being in the fertile window. Um, so, um, and also, uh, this is a graph for women with a regular 28 day cycle, but um, a lot of women don't have this regularity, so they have a um, and they have more variation. So um, the guidelines of date 10 to 17 may not apply to everybody in the first place. Okay. Maize was developed from a wild plant called Teosinte, which grows from Mexico south to Argentina. It's thought that cultivated maize was derived from Teosinte only once. Maize has been found at archaeological sites dated to um, 5,500 years ago. Figure 5.1 shows the genetic diversity at 10 gene loci in teosinte and in cultivated maize. This was determined by sequencing the DNA base pairs at each locus and calculating how much each of these base sequences, sequences varied. The gene loci are numbered in order of degree of diversity in teosinte. Okay, so here is the graph, here's the data. Compare the genetic diversity of teosinte with that of cultivated rice. So um, we can see that, in general, um, the genetic diversity is greater in teosinte than maize in almost each of these um, locus, lo loci, except for um, number seven. So nine out of ten of the loci, um, the genetic variation in teosinte is greater than maize. Okay? Suggest reasons for the differences in genetic diversity between teosinte and cultivated maize. So the reason is um, because so maize was derived from teosinte 
um, by artificial selection or selective breeding by humans. So um, because humans carry out the selection, they, um, they will select for uh, plants with desirable traits. So not all of the alleles are selected for in the first place in cultivated varieties. So this will um, inevitably increase the homozygosity within the population. And um, in a wild environment, um, you have a, great, a much greater variety of alleles that are needed um, for survival. So... Uh, the genetic variation um, will be great. Will will be greater in Tiocinte in the wild. Explain how these data support the idea that wild relative of crop plants such as maize should be conserved. So um, some of the so because they're still related, maize is still related to Tiocinte. Um, some of the alleles that are present um, in the wild relatives um, could be useful for future breeding. So, for example, um, we could breed in some traits that could help a maize cope with um, the changing climate, for example, or floods, or even if, um, f for example, if there was um, a disease that um, came along and wiped out um, most maize plants because they're so homozygous, um, then some, some, maybe some resistant traits could be bred into the maize plants from the Tiocinte. Most farmers today grow maize from seeds that have been produced by crossing two different homozygous parents. Explain why this is done. So this is done because of um, hybrid vigor. So hybrid vigor um, means that uh, they normally have a much higher yield than the homozygous parents. Um, and so it also helps with um, avoiding the expression of um, harmful alleles, like recessive alleles. Um, and... Um, it also um, helps to not have um, inbreeding depression, which is um, a real problem in some uh, monocultures. So figure 6.1 is a trace that shows the changes that occur in the membrane potential of a neuron during an action potential. Um, using the letters A to F from figure 6.1 state, which letters co corresponds to the following? So depolarization, um, we can see that is um, this part, so that would be B. Hyperpolarization is when um, the voltage goes um, below the resting potential, so that's E. The membrane is most, perme is most permeable to potassium, potassium ions, so that is, in this case, D. And the resting potential is around minus 70 millivolts, is both A and F. And F. Uh, saxitoxin is a powerful poison produced naturally by single cell eukaryotic photosynthetic marine organisms. Shellfish, shellfish may consume organisms containing saxitoxin but are unaffected. If humans were to eat shellfish, shellfish con containing saxitoxin, they would become very ill and may die. State the kingdom of to which the organism that produces saxitoxin belong. So these are um, protists. So Productista is the name of the kingdom. So luckily they gave us a really nice definition right there, single cell eukaryotic photosynthetic marine organisms. Um, obviously not all protists are um, photosynthetic, but they can be. So saxitoxin blocks sodium ion channels in the cell surface membranes of neurons. Describe the role of sodium ion channels in the transmission of a nerve impulse. So this one, um, there's voltage-gated uh, sodium um, ion channels. Um, and these channels uh, change shape and open when the membrane depolarizes or depolarizes. So, for example, when an action potential arrives or um, a neurotransmitter binds to receptors um, across the synaptic cleft, and this causes the sodium ions to flood in uh, because down their concentration gradients um, and the uh, channels close when the membrane. Um, repolarizes um, and with the help of so the sodium potassium pump um, the membrane returns to its resting potential okay 
suggest why saxitoxin may be fatal to humans. So if uh, saxitoxin um, blocks these channels, that means that uh, the action potentials um, couldn't be set up. So there would be no depolarization or de decrease in depolarization. So if that happens, that means that you would be essentially paralyzed. So um, there is a variety of um, uh, of processes in the human body that this is this would mean this would be fatal for. So for example, beating heart or um, just breathing or any uh, anything along those lines would be fatal to humans. The light dependent stage of photosynthesis takes place on the thylakoids of the chloroplast. Figure seven point one shows some of the components involved in the light dependent stage. Okay, so. Uh, with reference to figure 7.1, identify structures A and B. So from this, it's quite clear that um, A is photosystem 2 and B is photosystem 1. Okay? Describe the roles of the following substances in the light of independent stage of photosynthesis. So Ruby P. Um, Ruby P uh, is involved in carbon dioxide fixation. Um, so carbon dioxide and Ruby P with the help of Rubisco, will uh, produce uh, GP. Um, then reduced NADP. So reduced NADP uh, donates hydrogen uh, so that GP can be converted to triosphosphates. And ATP supplies the energy and the phosphate to convert GP to a triosphosphate and to regenerate Ruby P um, in the Calvin cycle. So. The Atlantic cod Gadus morhua is fished for food. Figure eight point one shows the size of the stocks of Atlantic cod between nineteen sixty eight and two thousand. Okay, so here is the um, cod stocks against time. Calculate the overall rate of decrease in size of the stocks of Atlantic cod between nineteen sixty eight and two thousand. So here, if we have a look, um, we've started in two hundred and eighty uh, thousand tons of cods. In 1968 and in 2000, we've got 40. So 240 divided by uh, the number of years, 1968 to 2000, that's 32 years, um, and we would get 7.5. However, this one, remember, 7.5 thousand tons. So here we would write 7,500 tons per year. Always look out for your units. Suggest how the stocks of Atlantic cod may be increased. So this one you can write a variety of things. So um, reduction of fishing is an obvious one. Um, then you could control the fishing. So um, by, for example, education. Then um, also um, could revise pollution. So control for pollution. Um, then um, you could uh, do some captive breeding and release, so so you could restock from fish farms, um, and um, yeah, so there's a variety of things that you can write something along those lines for this question. The passage below summarizes the effects of auxin on the growth of a shoot. Complete the passage by using the most appropriate scientific terms. So. Auxin is synthesized in the growing tips of shoots, um, apical buds. It's transported from here down the shoot by active transport from cell to cell and also, to a lesser extent, by mass flow in the foam. Um, I'll write these in. So, active transport and mass flow in the foam. Auxin seems to be involved in determining whether a plant grows upwards or whether it branches sideways. When the apical bud is actively growing, it tends to stop lateral buds from growing. This is called apical dominance. The plant grows upwards rather than branching out sideways. However, if the apical bud is cut off, the lateral buds start to grow. It's thought that removal of the apical bud causes the concentration of auxin in lateral buds to decrease. So, the buds can now grow by cell division and elongation. Okay. Cystic fibrosis is a genetic disease caused by an autosomal recessive allele. 
Gene therapy has been attempted to treat uh, CF since 1993. Outline the basic principles of gene therapy for treatment of uh, cystic fibrosis. So the idea of gene therapy is um, using um, genes as sort of a drug. So um, cystic fibrosis is uh, obviously caused by this mutation of the um, specifically of uh, a chloride channel called CFTR. And so this protein is defective. So if we were to insert um, a normal d d allele, dominant allele, um, into the DNA, then um, the person with a cystic fibrosis could um, express the normal um, protein. So the ways that people have tried to do this is um, to use gene therapy in the respiratory system. Um, so the um, the correct gene is inserted into a vector, such as an adenovirus um, or yeah, in, in liposomes, and so this um, construct is taken as a spray, so it's inhaled, and this virus would um, infect some of the cells um, that would take up the virus, and normally um, the gene is transiently expressed, but in some cases the gene can be incorporated into the DNA, and then that cell is transformed um, and um, is now able to express the normal um, protein. However, obviously not all cells take up the virus, and some, some, of, and not all of them will incorporate the, the gene in the first place. And also, gene therapy is known to have some side effects. And but I think the biggest problem is the fact that the effects are short-lived, so they will need to be um, repeated. Okay. Describe the role of a genetic counsellor in dealing with genetic diseases in humans, and discuss the circumstances in which a couple might be referred to a genetic counsellor. So um, a couple might be referred to a genetic counsellor if either of them has uh, a genetic disease in the fam or or it runs in the family um, or they could be carriers. So um, or if the woman is um, older or there is a history of miscarriages, for example. So what the counsellor could do is um, do a pedigree analysis uh, or a DNA analysis. Um, or a detailed sort of genetic screening. So they could take the tissue samples or you, they could do um, IVF and then test the embryos um, and then they could discuss the results of the test and then discuss what they could do if they find something. So um, they can estimate the um, effects on the child and then they could discuss maybe um, termination of the pregnancy or alternative therapies um, and then they could also discuss what um, the financial uh, implications of having um, an affected child would be and sort of discuss any more ethical issues or concerns. Okay. Describe the role of the hormone insulin in maintaining a constant blood glucose concentration. So, um, insulin, uh, sorry, the rise in blood glucose concentration is detected in, the in beta cells in the pancreas. Um, and the insulin by the beta cells is re is released into the blood, um, and then the insulin will bind to surface receptor surface receptor in cells in, for example, um, liver cells or muscle cells, and uh, by increasing permeability to glucose um, in response to insulin, they will take up glucose and increase in the use of glucose in respiration or in the liver they will increase the uh, conversion of glucose to glycogen, and therefore the effect is that blood glucose concentration falls. And in addition to that, um, uh, insulin is also known to inhibit um, glycogen breakdown. Okay. So, the hormone human uh, chorionic gonadotrophin, or HCG, is produced by a woman in the early stages of pregnancy. Describe how a pregnancy test kit can detect the presence of HCG. So, um, so HCG helps in the formation of the placenta, and um, it's just a, it's, it's a hormone, and what the aim of the, pre the pregnancy test is to detect whether or not there is um, a concentration of this hormone in the urine. So what happens is that the stick um, is dipped in um, an early morning urine sample. Normally it's early morning because then the concentration of HCG isn't diluted by drinks. 
um, and the HCG um, acts as an antigen. So there is uh, different regions in the t in the test. So um, initially, um, the so there's some ant mobile antibodies that bind to um, an antigen on the HCG, and um, um, and on this antigen, uh, sorry, on this antibody, um, it, it's conjugated to either a dye um, or probably yeah, normally a dye. And um, um, what happens is uh, that then you go through this sort of first region, and on in the first region there is a second antibody that is immobilized, and this also recognizes HCG. So HCG will bind to the second antibody. It's called a sandwich assay, if you can imagine. So you've got your um, sort of second antibody mobilized like that on the surface, um, and then if this is HCG, let's say. So this recognizes HCG, and then on top of previously um, another antibody that is conjugated to a dye, let's say, um, also bound to HCG. So like that, this would be the first window. Um, and then uh, in here, the uh, colored indicators will not diffuse away, so they will show um, that HCG binds to this region. And then the flow, um, and then the third, sorry, the second window or the second region is the controlled region. So um, that is just a third kind of antibody on the surface, and which is specific to um, this antibody, which has the conjugated dye. So they would bind to the surface here. And the reason why this is important is. Uh, so this is all all the unbound antibodies that don't bind to HCG, and the reason why this is important. Oh yeah, this is the flow of urine, um, and the reason why this is important is the control region. So this one is just to show that um, indeed this um, antibody which has the dye is present, and that the the um, the test is working well. Okay, so just quickly, if you've got your HCG. In here, um, and then your indicator will bind like so. Okay, um, and that is it. So, hopefully, you found that useful. Um, thank you for joining me, and um, I'll see you soon.